the Jews, he's putting it very plainly to them, the God of the Jews chose me, Paul, to come and to be a messenger, an emissary, or someone who is urgently driven to bring you good news, good information. He said, I'm, very, I'm an apostle for Christ, which is a big thing because he was anti-Christ. He was the anti-Christ right up until his conversion on the Nazi. And he saw the light and the revelation. And God took his belief system and turned his belief system upside down. And he said, this is your belief system. Now take it and turn it upside down and apply it to Jesus. And make the two fit together. And Paul went away for two years after this blinding experience and, and contemplated what that meant. Because that was a lot of information to switch over from where he was to where God took him. And then we get to see the beauty of who he is as he writes to us the New Testament or the New Covenant. And he says to us, um, you are, I'm writing to this, you, to you who are holy. You are holy. You've been made holy. It's a work that's done. And I, and, and that you're one with Jesus. You are in union. You are, even though we don't physically have our new body and we are not in heaven and joined with Christ physically as our beloved, as our husband, because we are the bride of Christ, but we are joined to him in the trophy, in that we are con contracted or coveted with him eternally, eternally. And so he says, you're one with Jesus, and he's the Messiah, the Savior, the healer. He is the anointing oil, which goes back to the healing of our sins. He is the oil that pours into us that heals all our brokenness. And so he says, he's the only one. And God himself, that's again, Yahweh, God himself, the heavenly father of our Lord Jesus Christ, release grace. Now grace is already, listen to this, because this is important. Grace is already released inside of you because of who you are. <clears throat> when you accept Christ, grace is released inside of you, and you are made perfect. That is that position. Grace is released. You're perfect. He said that grace that's been released in you is also by God himself released over you. Woo! Okay. I mean, I want you to catch this. That grace is released over you and in, in and a part to you, gives to you, that imparting to you, giving to you total well-being into your lives. What is total well-being? Total well-being is healing spiritually, mentally, and physically. Healing for the spirit, the soul, and the body. That's total well-being, and that's what God wants for us. And I'm not talking about wellness in the sense of never being sick. I'm talking in a wellness of living well. Living in wellness. We don't know how to do that, okay, guys. We don't know how to live in complete godly wellness. And so he says, but it's a gift, it's yours, and God is releasing it on you all the time. It's in you being released all the time. It's on you being released. The Holy Spirit in you is releasing that grace constantly, constantly, constantly. That grace that's released in you takes the, the mind of Christ and begins to Change your thinking. Change how you think, how you see things, how, what your view is. You no longer have the same view as you've had before Christ came in. You begin to change your view, your opinion. It's a process. That's sanctification. But it is a done work inside, and God is pouring that on us from the outside to make us well from the inside out and from the outside in. That is this beautiful dance that we are doing with the divine. I mean, if we can just get past our own selves, we are our own biggest hindrance to our relationship with God. So, may God himself release that grace on you. Now, he goes down. Now, that's, his, that's just his introduction. That was exciting all in and of itself. I could say, okay, we're done. Let's go home. Because that is a whole new life. That's just the greeting. Then he says, every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, I mean, get your head around 
sure of this. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has already been lavished upon you as a love gift from the wonderful Heavenly Father. I mean, I know when I read Ephesians in that, that's not quite what I got out of it. Was that what you got out of it? He is saying he's lavished on you every spiritual gift, everything that you need to be perfect and holy in him, he's already lavished every bit of that on you. You are that person already. You've been lavishly gifted with everything, every character of God is already in you. It's lavished on you and it's lavished outside of you in that God is, has clouded you with his presence. So that you are walking as an internally caring God and externally caring God with you everywhere you go. Every person you speak to, everything you do, think, say, eat, smell, touch, it all is in the presence of God. You are never out of the presence of God. You are never out of the presence of God, inside and out. So, what does that mean? Well, he's lavished that on you from the wonderful Heavenly Father of the Lord Jesus, all because, this is why, this is it, because he sees you wrapped in Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you what, with Christ being on the inside, and what we see again and again, and I'm not going to get into so many things, because I have just, I have I just want to just pour this all on you because I want you to understand it. But when it talks about being wrapped in Christ, this is, an, we have become an amalgam of being blended internally with Christ. He is changing us just like when Christ, listen to me, the first miracle that Christ did was he changed the water into he took these containers. He, took, he went to a wedding. He showed up at the wedding. Oh, and this is my son. I don't know what he's wanting. <laughs> he's killing me. He's killing me. He's killing me. He's killing me. I'm going to turn him off. But I also have my hand. So somebody's got to tell him when, the, when it's time because I don't have my clock now. So when, when Jesus went to this wedding, he, had, he was just turning 30, he was just coming to the age where he was old enough to now be a priest. A, he was old enough to go into the synagogue and teach. He was at the age of being a priestly rabbi. And so he's, he has the authority to go in and out of the synagogue, which means he's, he's, Christ is knowledgeable. You know, they don't just let anybody walk in the synagogue and start teaching. Okay? So Christ is starting his ministry, but he's just, it's just started. This is his first miracle. He's even saying to his mom, Mom, the time of me being out there and all this going on isn't quite there yet. And she's like, do whatever he says, just listen to him. She's so uh, confident and assured. And she says, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. So this story is really interesting because he takes these cisterns. These cisterns were for sacrificial or, or for sanctification, where the, when the people would come in to the home to eat, um, they would stop, or for the wedding or any kind of gathering, they would stop, and they would have these vessels at the door for you to clean it. You would clean, because you, did, you couldn't eat in the Jewish tradition being unclean unless you had sacramentally cleansed yourself. And so they had, they had a procedure. So here's these containers. It says they come in. They wash all the dirt off of their hands and off of themselves. And they have to do it in a certain way. You know, yeah. And so it's very, very ritualistic. And then they go into the wedding and they're considered clean. And they can interact with everybody. But that word, word is not clean, is it? No. After people have come in and come in and come in, it becomes dirty from the, from the filth of the people. And so... Christ said something really interesting. He said, take those vessels and to fill them with clean water. 
which meant they had to be empty first. They had to be empty in order to be filled. And when we get saved, what happens is we are emptied. We empty ourselves. And then we are filled back up with fresh water. And that is the water of the Holy Spirit. Christ comes in us and he cleanses us. And he begins to wash us through the Holy Spirit. But, what, but that wasn't the goal. The goal wasn't just to be cleaned up and to get the, these sacramental you know, vessels that are for cleaning and set them with fresh water and go, okay, now just serve this to the people. Well, they didn't want water. They didn't come for water, have they? They didn't come for something that was going to bring them joy, wine, something that was going to give them joy. It was a celebration. They were celebrating life. The union of two people. God's celebrating life with us by the union of two people. Us and Christ. And so the, the process of that is, is that as we are made new, we are emptied out. And we are filled, not with what religion says is going to clean up everybody, but with the Holy Spirit that actually does do the clean. And once that vessel is clean, and that clean water was put in for sanctification, then the, they were told, the servants were told, scoop it out, which was still water, and serve. And while they were serving, what happened? It became wine. It became wine. So listen, here's what I see in that. God cleans us up through sanctification so that when we literally are dipped into in our lives and we and we make contact with another person in any capacity, any capacity at all. What we give them is not our own sanctification, but we give them Christ, the wine. And he does that. He makes what is in us, the, the sanctification, the purification, become the the wine that is given out that people see the purity of who he is. That wine was the best wine they had. <laughs> when they tasted it, they were like, we've not had a wine like this before. This is different. This is not what they usually do. They usually give the good stuff in the beginning, and then when everybody's a little happy, they give them the junk. <laughs> but this was the best because it was Christ. And that's what Christ is telling us in Sanctification, when we allow God to change us from the inside out, that sanctification, then when we, anything that outflows of our life, it is Jesus, it is not us. It is wine. It is purity. It is not judgmental. It is Christ's life. <clears throat> so when I interact with Sandra, I'm not to... I'm not to take anything out of myself, my sanctification, my walk, my belief system, what I have as what God is doing to purify me, and try to force that upon judgment of someone else. What I'm sharing with her is, this is the joy of the Lord. This is new life. And new life is love. That blood of Jesus was representation of his giving everything, his life. So when I am dipped out of me in my imperfection, and I serve Louise, I am to give her the wine that is my Christ, my beloved, my lover <laughs> of my soul. And I'm to give that to her so that she falls in love with him too. Now if I give her anything tainted with me, then she's not going to understand the purity of Jesus. She's getting not truth mixed with truth. She's getting my personality mixed with God's personality. She's getting corruption mixed with incorruption. How does that happen? Because I'm not the water either. I'm the vessel. And that vessel needs to be a 
vessel that is appropriate for that wine. That vessel that they used had no significance in cleansing anything until Christ spoke to it. And it became something different. You become different. You become different because Christ is in you. Your container changes outside to in. And then, this is the part I don't understand, and I can't understand it, but somehow, somehow, when I am able to hand that wine to her, and she finds the joy of the Lord, that gives me joy. That flows back into me, and enriches and gives me joy. But what happens if I give her something that's not pure? Suppose I give her something that's very tainted with my anger, tainted with my judgment, tainted with my opinion, tainted with how I think she needs to live, tainted with what I think she's done wrong. Then I am giving her wine that is not Jesus. I'm giving her vinegar. I am giving her something that does not taste like Christ. It tastes like me. It is spoiled by my container. Do you get what I'm saying? Christ changes us so that he can flow out of us and be a miracle in her life. My experience with Christ makes a miracle in my life. But it's also supposed to be an outflow of whatever is happening in me should be happening around me. If I am love inside and I recognize the love God has given to me by calling me perfect, then I need to see you as perfect. I'm not to see you as broken. The only thing that I am to look at you and see broken is if you're hurting. And then I need to say, how can I help you? What can I do? <coughs> how can I be an assistant to make your pain less? And a lot of times it's because people are in pain because they don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. They don't understand who they are in God. So let's look just a little bit more. We have a couple more minutes. Not many, but I want to just close with this because I want you to get this. We're wrapped in Christ. And then we, that's what it says. That's why we celebrate God. It says that's why we celebrate God because that's what He's brought into our lives. All right. So that's why we celebrate with all our hearts. It says number four, He chose us to be His very own, joining us to Himself even before the foundation of the world. Now this this was something that I got really interested in because I could hear y'all talking too. That word He chose actually comes from a word that means He. Spoke. He spoke. Okay? And then it says he spoke us to be his own, his very own. And that word means, that right there means word. Just like what you are talking about, the word. In the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God. So it says he spoke to us, he spoke us to be or to become, to become. His very own, and that it, it says word, his word, which actually, when you go back and look at it, it says, he spoke your name. When did he speak your name? Before he even laid the foundation of the world. Do you know what that means? That means that for all eternity, God had your name on his lips. Just like you have with every breath, his name on your lips. It says here that before the foundation of the world, that Christ, he, God, God chose you. He knew you by name. You were his very own before the foundation of the world. Ladies, you are that special to God. Now the thing is, is he chose us there wasn't one that he didn't choose. He chose us all. <clears throat> but the fact is, he, and he knows each of our names, and he loves each.
each of us so desperately, and he wants us to have the joy that he created us to live in. And we have to choose to tap into that and to recognize it in us and to live in it and to stop living in the suffering and the pain, but to recognize that we can live in joy because he has filled us with himself. And then it says, so he chose us to join to himself before the foundation world because, because of his great love. He ordained us, which means he laid his hands on us. He ordained us. He blessed us. He laid his hand on us before he even picked up the soil and created us. He had already created us in his imagination. So he adored and he ordained us so that we would be seen as holy. By who? In his eyes. With an unsustained, oh my gosh, an unsustained innocence. That there is absolutely perfection in you. That, oh, I did have a call. That God said is His gift. Now, I want you to go a little bit further because this is where it just gets so good. For it was always His perfect plan. That plan there was always perfectly planned to include you. He had a perfect plan to adopt you as his delightful child. <laughs> I'm serious. That's what this says. When you go back into the, into the Greek, this is what this says about us and God's opinion of us. He's made you and adopted you via an a, a, a beautiful child, a beautiful offspring of his. Through the union of Jesus, the anointed one. So that his tremendous love, and it's going back to God again, so his tremendous love for us that cascades over us. I just, I just love this. That cascades over us would glorify his grace would be an advertisement for his grace to others. For it's always been there. And since we're joined to Christ and we have been given the treasures of redemption by his blood, we have the total cancellation of our sins. All because of that cascading grace, this is abundant, super abundant grace that's powerfully working in us releasing within us all forms of wisdom and practical understanding. And through the revelation of Christ, he's unveiled his secret desire for us, to us, the hidden mystery of his long-range plan for us, which he delighted to implement from the beginning. And because of God's unfailing purpose, he detailed, this detailed plan will reign supreme through every period of time until the fulfillment of the ages finally reaches its climax when God makes all things perfect in all of heaven and all of earth through Christ Jesus. Wow. It's, I mean, there's just so much there that is so good. We're stamped. Now, I want you to look real quick in verse 14. So we're stamped with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, and it's given to us like an engagement ring. Given to a bride as a first installment of what's coming next. He is our hope, promise of our future inheritance that seals us until we are all until we have all of redemption's promises and experience it in complete freedom <laughs> for the supreme glory and honor of God the Father. This is His. This is all done for His pleasure. See, we want to look at all this, you know, this is, 
This is all about what's God doing in me and for me and to me and, and what is it about with me, Alfie? What is life all about? But it's not about us. It isn't God's story. It is God's story. God had a need in his life. He needed you. He needed you. He needed me. And because he needed you so badly, he knew before he created anything that the only way to get you, the only way to have you, was to die. So that what happened in the garden, that fall, and he talks about this very clearly, when that fall happened, that broke God's heart, even though he knew it was going to happen. Before it happened, he had already made a plan for what was happening because he wanted it so desperately that he said, even though I know what the next section of time will be, and it will be a world that will just, just be so difficult and hard on itself. It just, humans cause other humans and themselves to suffer. That's what we do. We judge and we make people suffer because we don't fit in anywhere. You're so unique and individual, there really is no home for you anywhere on this earth, just like there was no home for Jesus. The only place you're going to find home is in Jesus. And when you are in Jesus, he begins to show you who you really are and what you were created for. And you are created for a relation, a love, lifelong, eternal, long relationship with the divine God. And so that's what Paul tells us in the first three chapters of this beautiful book. He's going to beat it into you who you are. He's going to feed it in who you are. And then, the last three chapters, he's going to say, now how can you act like that? I'm going to tell you how that is. But the next two, two lessons, or three lessons, we are looking at your position. Go home today. Get yourself in a quiet place with God. Quiet. No distractions. No TV. No phone. No music. No nothing. Go into your silent closet and be quiet and sit and contemplate who God created in you. Who are you in God? And how has he made you so, so unique and special and perfect and precious when you can't, when you don't and let him show you who he is. I'm saying, I gave a simple prayer to the Lord. And if you have not sometimes because you ask not. And I didn't ask. And when I did ask, he answered. And it's been phenomenal. I said to God one day, I don't know how to love you. Love is so tainted by mis- We don't understand love. Only God does. So I said, God, show me how to love you. Well, he started doing that. And it was painful. Because it started emptying me. And I had to empty me more and more and more to have room for more and more and more of him. And as I'm doing that, there's no end to that. There's constantly more, I'm telling you. There's no end. I know nothing of him. I'm only touching the surface. But the more I say, let me understand how to love you, the more he's opening his word, the more he's opening my sight to things that he's doing around me, the more he's opening my vision of God in you and how perfect and wonderful you are. And I am beginning to live in a different love because I And after I asked that, and started seeing that, I was like, ooh, ooh, okay, show me how to love Billy, my husband, like I'm loving you. Woo! Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't pray that unless you really want it. It is painful. It's painful. 
you turn it to, to loving that person who you are supposed to love unconditionally and lavishly and without any limits, with no conditions. And then you go, oh, I need to do that for my children. Oh, my room children, my grandchildren. Oh, I need to do that for the obnoxious neighbor next door. Oh, I need to do that for the person who really hurt me, they molested me when I was 12. And you have to begin to root out of yourself those things that don't leave room for God. And once those things start coming out, and God starts replacing and showing you who he is and how to really love him and how much, and that comes from him showing his love to you because we can't love him unless we understand his love for us first. And as we begin to yield to that, he begins to make that love for, flow over. And all of a sudden, you're no longer giving a dirty cup of water that tastes like vinegar. You are giving new wine. New wine. And, and this woman has a lot of wine that she gives out. But sometimes she needs wine. She needs it from me, which is love. That's new wine. And when you spread that out to other people, you literally are giving love and you're giving Jesus. But I can't do that genuinely if while I'm reaching out and giving her love, I'm thinking she really needs to you know, do this, and needs to do this, and she needs to fix this, and she, and she has all of these issues, and I have the answers. No, I don't. God has the answers. And God can only share the answers with her through my example, not through my mouth or my judgment. It's through my action. All right, that's a lot. I'm sorry, or whatever. That's a lot. We didn't finish the chapter, so... I don't know how long we'll be in Ephesians, maybe next year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I love you guys. So, thank you all so much. Go out.